Robinson he even went down the sideline and he's got Cass Decker bringing you UCLA football content all throughout the year for LA Football Network. Bruin Bible is back after the holiday season. Will Decker, your host, joined as always by our good friend, the madman, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Jamal Madney in the cut, coming to you live to talk about some Bruins, some bowl games. Uh, big special name returning for the the Sun Bowl itself, I think that's going to be the major story of the podcast. Talk about some transfers going on. Madman, first and foremost, how was the holiday season and how did you spend it here in L.A.? Holiday season was great, Will. So great to see you and happy holidays to you and your loved ones and all of our viewers out there. It's been a fun holiday season for us. We've just been kind of local after lots of travel this year, so it's been nice when both sets of parents are, are local. So we've had a lot of holiday parties, a lot of birthday parties, and just kind of get togethers with friends and family. It's such a special time. I've always said that if all year could be the holiday season, so much of our world's problems would go away. It's just such a special time of the year and, and, and thrill that, that we've had a really nice one. That's amazing, man. And it's so accurate too. There's something about being around with family where, a lot of your, you know, problems, day-to-day problems tend to disappear when you realize that this is what really matters most, being with the ones you love, being with the people that matter most. And speaking about what matters most in the sports world, the Bruins. We've had a hell of a month. A lot of great things have happened. And Bruins got a little late Christmas gift uh, this week as the like another legend in our eyes. My opinion, the most exciting UCLA football player we've had in the last decade plus. DTR deciding to put it on one more time with the pads for UCLA and play the Sun Bowl uh, this upcoming week. Madman, this is huge, and it's very exciting to have our guy back. What was kind of your initial thoughts on hearing that, you know, this this player that holds the majority of the records for quarterbacks is deciding to put it on one more time as opposing to sit out for the NFL draft? Yeah, well, you had a feeling that it was going to – this was going to happen. He's, you know, to me, the greatest competitor that UCLA football has ever had. I think it speaks to him as a person of wanting to end his UCLA career the right way. Let's not forget that he's been with UCLA for five years. He's been with Chip from day one and Chip and, and DTR have never played in a bowl game together. So this is really a symbolic game. I think there's so much to play for. This is UCLA's only fourth opportunity since the turn of the century to have 10 wins, to be able to win a Sun Bowl and to really be able to set the stage for this program going into 2023 and beyond. And I think even in addition to DTR, will the sort of involvement of Charbonnet in preparation, the involvement of Bobo, the involvement of John Gaines, everybody wants to play. And when you look across some of the videos that are out there, even in terms of the welcome reception, they're dancing on the floor. They've come with, you know, there's sombreros on. They're, they're really sort of soaking up and basking in this bowl experience. I think they understand how important it is. It just shows the pride that each of these guys has in wearing the UCLA blue and gold. I think it shows the culture that Chip has built about how important it is to finish what you've started. And I just think it's, it just sets such a great example for the young players and the future leaders of this program going into 2023 about the importance of finishing. So it's just all goodness there. And it starts with DTR. Obviously, Will, I'm sure you'll mention this, but 285 pass yards away to break Cade McNown's record. Obviously, he's got the total yards. He's got the total touchdowns. He's got the, the completions. He's got so many of the records. This is one left. And I think Chip's going to try and dial it up in a way where he gets it. And, and they're able to have kind of this swan song with coach and quarterback uh, one last time. So really excited about that. Yeah. And you beat me to the punch with the Cade McNown uh, record at stake there. And it just goes back to the bond that Chip and DTR possess. It's such a rarity to see that level of love and that level of outpouring between coach and player. And it's a big reason why DTR opted to come back last year 
despite hearing, you know, the rumors of Dylan Gabriel coming in and maybe trying to compete for that starting spot. Obviously it didn't end well with that. Gabriel ended up going back to Oklahoma, but having DTR back with chip for one final year and, you know, having the ability to play in a bowl game. I mean, we had the holiday bowl last year, unfortunately it got canceled. He wants to go out in a way where he has that bowl game experience. He can look back with his teammates at reunions and different events and toast to the bowl game that they're playing the sun bowl. By the way, this is the fifth time UCLA will be playing the Sun Bowl. They are three and one, the last of which occurred back in 2013 when UCLA and Brett Hundley took on Virginia Tech 142 to 12 in that game. So very hype for DTR, a lot of records at stake. But I want to take a moment just to kind of appreciate DTR because this is such a big, big, you know, name in the UCLA brand and a, a name that's going to live on in the record books for years to come for future UCLA fans. Give me, you know, just you know, your favorite play, your favorite game performance that a guy like DTR had, because this guy was electrifying to watch in the best way possible. You know, multiple plays that make you jump off your couch as a fan and just makes you love the game of football. So give me some of those madman that where you were just like, DTR is our quarterback. We're going to ride with this guy till the end. And UCLA is clearly doing that in his final game. It's been such a journey, Will, with DTR of, of being this sort of raw prospect coming in with Chip, the very first games at Oklahoma, home against Cincinnati, some rough starts, going three and nine, four and eight, having to deal with COVID, and now ultimately getting to this point. And so in so many ways, DTR kind of symbolizes the ups and the downs of life in a lot of ways. And, and a lot of what has happened in the world the last few years. I mean, think about when DTR started at quarterback. We were in a pre-COVID world. Things were just so different in society and in life. And we've sort of grown with him. And so I think for me, the legacy is not just going to be the stats and he's going to have all of them. He's going to be essentially sort of the, the Dan Marino of UCLA football for a number of years. But it's also just the growth with him and that we could sort of line up with life. You know, Will, you and I are big basketball fans. We've talked about this, of how, you know, you've grown up with a Steph Curry. Steph Curry coming into uh, the NBA in 2009. You know, how old were you in 2009? And you growing with Steph as a warrior. For me, that guy was Kobe. And I was 12 years old when, when Kobe broke in with the Lakers. And I went from 12 years old to a married man with, with, with Kobe as a Laker. And so... Oftentimes, those connections are you growing with the player. And so it's these iconic moments, but it's also that area under the curve of all of those great performances. And now to sort of answer your specific question, obviously, everything has to begin with that SC game last year and just those signature performances, the hurdle, the autograph, and just being able to sort of vindicate this program in a way where, recall, going into that game, Will, we were still sort of on the fence of Chip Kelly's job security. He, he sort of needed to win that game to feel safe going into 2022. And just everything on the line, it felt like UCLA was able to avenge the 50 to nothing loss to USC back in 2011. And sort of all was right with the world in terms of balancing that out. That was such an iconic performance. I go back a couple of years to that incredible 33-point comeback against Washington State, yeah. that Pac-12 after dark game, 67-63. He went bonkers that night for 467 yards, five touchdowns. Still the greatest comeback uh, in the last 40 years of college football from a numbers perspective. That UCLA team was 1-5, in five, went into Pullman, a very difficult place to play, and that was 130 combined points, Will, in a regular in a regulation game. I'll always remember that. And then, of course, the two great performances this year of against Washington, his first victory against a ranked team, obviously bulldozing that lineman to prevent the interception, another hurl, that sidestep play where the two guys banged into each other. It looked like it was straight out of a movie. And then following that up with beating Utah, the team that is now two-time uh, Pac-12 back-to-back champions, the team that had given him such a hard time over the course of his career. Everyone remembers in 2017, that 49-3 game, for him to grow up and be able to beat Utah in the emphatic fashion that he was able to do so, and then just battling to the very end with Caleb Williams in, in, in that SCUCLA game, fighting concussion, fighting injuries, and, and going shot for shot with him. So those are just some of the, the memories 
will, but he's always going to be remembered as that first guy to me in, in much in the way I think Carson Palmer paved the road for that Pete Carroll era to then enable the liner and the Bush teams to have an enormity of success. I'm going to remember DTR as the guy who paved the road for this Chip Kelly era for the Dante Moores of the world and for the great players uh, to, to sort of build on top of him and make UCLA the great team that they were in the 80s. So his place in history is UCLA history is secure. It is firm. It is complicated. It is polarizing. It is electric. But that's all the things that DTR is. And I'm so proud that he was a Bruin for five years. Yes. And I mean, you've had this claim uh, of him being the greatest competitor in UCLA football history. And, you know, for me, I wanted to see him back that up and play in the bowl game. And I know this is a different era we're playing in now where it's kind of the norm to do that. But maybe I'm a little old school and seeing, you know, you've worked all year to get to this point to play in this bowl game. And for somebody to sit out, that just doesn't that doesn't leave a good taste in my mouth. You're kind of abandoning the team saying, hey, you guys have fun. I'm going to the NFL. I may not even hit you guys up when I get there. My cell phone number's changing. I'm in the NFL now. I don't want to talk to you anymore. But with DTR coming back, it shows what this program means to him. And I can, you know, legitimately say that this, your point of him being the greatest competitor is backed up by that claim. I want to throw in a couple of points to the Stanford game last year. The comeback he had against Stanford, he gets knocked down. His shoulder is, you know, damn near dislocated. You know, it's, it's hanging off by the edge. He has to get in there to fool the defense enough to get a touchdown. And he doesn't even just deliver. He throws the game-winning touchdown pass, had some big strikes to Kyle Phillips. LSU game comes to mind, too. He was making huge plays. That was a very legitimizing victory for UCLA. National television, Ed Orgeron in the house coming through. And, you know, those those Sissy Blues played well that night, uh, the famous line goes. So, you know, DTR, just an ultimate competitor, and we are so thrilled and privileged to get one more game out of this talented quarterback. So our thoughts with DTR, I got to bring up another guy too, before we get into the bowl game prediction, Kaz Allen, unfortunately has played his last game in a UCLA Jersey. He's going to the NFL and it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's beautiful at the same time. When you look back on a guy like Kaz's career, the, I mean, we use the term electric with, you know, DTR and with Kaz Allen, I don't think Chip Kelly's had a player at UCLA legitimately where every time this guy touched the ball, there were high enough odds where you felt this guy could take it to the house any given time. A house call was always in the realm of possibility with Kaz Allen there. And the moment there's a, there's many great moments. The USC game stands out from last year, but the game that stood out to me this particular season, we get to the ASU game. Charbonnet goes out. And we're like, crap, what are we going to do? You know, he's the MVP of the team. He's our high draft pick coming in to the 2023 NFL draft. And Kaz Allen has the game of his life. And I mean, just multiple 30, 40, 50. He had like a 75-yard touchdown run in that game. And you made a great point with why the defense collapsed in that game. I remember after the ASU game was the defense couldn't catch their breath because they just handed off to Kaz house call And the defense has to go back out there and play defense. And, you know, we saw those three long touchdown runs, but electric isn't even the word. You know, the Casmanian devil was the famous nickname. Energizer Bunny comes to mind. I mean, this guy was just lightning quick and so much fun to watch. What is your memories of Kaz Allen in a UCLA uniform before we wish him well heading to the NFL draft? Yeah, well, I, you know, my memories of Kaz Allen, again, are also – really being there at the beginning of the Chip Kelly era. You know, he made that huge splash with that 80-yard run against Cincinnati all the way back in 2017. And, you know, we were like, man, the arrival of the most multidimensional weapon potentially in, in UCLA football history is upon us. And he was just such a great teammate. Uh, he was dynamic, obviously, with the world-class track star speed. We're always going to remember, again, that great SC game, as you mentioned last year, the the three touchdowns, his game against ASU this year, the 200 total yards, the house call from 70-plus, and just being able to allow the UCLA offense to be the same as they were without Charbonnet spoke volumes. 
his incredible run against Stanford this year, the great reception against USC this year in the fourth quarter for 45 yards and a touchdown when he was clearly struggling with an ankle injury and gutted his way through that game. I remember last year, the first, you know, the, the interesting thing with Caswell is that he was essentially had the first receiving touchdown of the season, both in 21 and in 22. If you remember the very first Hawaii, yeah. touchdown against Hawaii down that right sideline, 43 yards. And then this year, the bubble screen to Bowling Green for about 20 yards in the touchdown. So he was always the guy who set that trend uh, and got us started in the right way in the season. And there's one game that also I'm reminded of, Will, that sort of gets lost in the SC game and the Arizona State game and Stanford and, and whatnot. Last year against Arizona, if you recall, at Tucson, Arizona was a pretty bad team, and UCLA was sort of sleepwalking through that game, struggling. It was 17-16 in the third quarter of that game against arguably the worst team in America, and Kaz has a huge kickoff return to sort of set the stage for UCLA to be able to pull away in that game and start building the momentum that they needed to finish strong uh, with, with that 8-4 and four record and really set the tone in that second half with this great special teams play. So Kaz is one of those guys who, electric on the field, I think in this modern NFL, there's really an opportunity for him to find a niche for himself, kick returning, punt returning, being kind of a 2-2 Atwell type of receiver in the NFL and, and finding different packages to get him the ball. He had the opportunity to come back, obviously, with the COVID year for potentially a sixth year, but I think this was the right move for him. I mean, he was starting to outlive various presidents and presidential terms, I think, if he came back. So this was absolutely the right move for him. And especially given his frame, uh, you know, the risk of injury is very high. Um, and so I completely understand him needing to get his mind and body right for the NFL. We wish him nothing but the best. We're going to be rooting him on uh, during the, the senior bowl circuit and, uh, you know, during sort of uh, draft season and getting him ready for that NFL draft. And that's wherever he lands up, it's going to be another favorite team of mine in the NFL. Kaz Allen, again, representing everything that UCLA football is all about in this Chip Kelly era, academic, athletic, spiritual, social, and wishing him nothing but the best thriller. Yeah, and you summarized it the perfect way, and it brought back a particular play. He is the ultimate spark plug you can have. It, nothing could be going right. You get a play to Kaz Allen. It turns into 10 more yards than it should be because he's electric. He's got track speed out there, and the offense starts to flow. And the perfect you know, play that comes to mind with that, you may remember the LSU game. First series on offense, we get stalled. Defense forces a stop. And then we get the ball back deep in our own territory. I think we're at the, you know, five or six yard line. And DTR did a quick three-step three step drop, hit it to the left sideline, and Kaz got a 30-yard catch. And that was kind of the moment that I felt for UCLA where everyone kind of did an exhale. It was like, okay, we're here. We can compete with these guys. This is the SEC. They just won a championship two years ago. Doesn't matter. We just got 30 quick yards on them. Let's do what we do best. And that was Kaz Allen in a nutshell. He was the guy that was going to give you the spark when you needed it and give your offense confidence moving forward. We are so excited to cover Kaz moving to the NFL, you know, in 2023. So very pumped for our guy there. Now we got to talk about the bowl game. Bowl game is interesting <laughs> this year, Mad Man, as the Sun Bowl. This is a team that we're going to be playing that really doesn't have the key players that got them here in the first place. So it's a little harder to prepare for than normal. Let me kind of tell you what's going on. This is per – Ben Bolch's article on the LA Times. Keaton Slovis, you know, a guy we're very familiar with as UCLA fans, opting to transfer from Pitt to Brigham Young. All-American defensive tackle Kalija Kansi, he's out with a shoulder injury in this game. Uh, and then first team all ACC running back. And I mean, this guy was unbelievable. He should have been on the short list, you know, for the Doak Walker with our guy, Zach Charbonnet. Israel Abaconda, uh, he's out for the game as well as all ACC middle linebackers, Servokia Dennis, who opted out to both, you know, put their chances in for the NFL draft. So that would be like us as UCLA going, hey, our five best players are DTR, Charbonnet, Bobo, Latu, and Muasau. And four of those guys are out. So it's a little harder to prepare. Uh, Nick Patty is going to be playing quarterback for them in the bowl game. Less than 20 passes on the season. 
Um, they've got a new running back coming in that's going to be taking the carries away from Abaconda. Madman, this is a very talented pit team. Uh, Pat Narduzzi is a great coach. Uh, they were number 16 in the nation in total defense, number eight in rushing defense. So I am excited to see the minds kind of at work as Narduzzi is a defensive you know, mastermind. He's a very good defensive mind going against our Chip Kelly with the offensive mind. Still a lot of good things in the bowl game. What are you looking uh, forward to most in this bowl game in the Sun Bowl? Yeah, well, it's it's definitely a contrast of styles, right? And, and we've talked about it, obviously, UCLA being one of only four teams in America to average over 500 yards per game against a team that, as you mentioned, 14th in total defense, 8th in rushing defense. A little bit difficult, though, Will, when your two best defensive players that anchored this 14th ranked defense are not there. And so the, the reality of the situation is Pitt, a very solid eight and four team, but they, they are without their two best offensive players in this game. And they're without their two best defensive players in this game. And so this, this should be a UCLA victory and this should be a UCLA victory comfortably. I think what I'm looking for, for UCLA specifically, again, is how can we build on that Cal game and be able to get multiple guys involved. And even though Charbonnet is going to play and suit up because he's Superman and he's just Captain America and he's pick your favorite superhero and ultimate guy, I think the responsible thing to do if you're Chip Kelly is limit him to eight to 10 carries, which means there's now, again, opportunity for TJ Harden. There's opportunity for Keegan Jones. There's opportunity for Colson Yankoff. There's opportunities for guys to really sort of step in to that RB1 role next year and build that requisite momentum. So I'm looking for those guys to have big games and continue to execute this phenomenal run game against a top 10 rushing attack, albeit without their two best players. And then again, I'm looking for a great performance from DTR and Bobo as, as sort of signature caps to their career. Would love to see DTR be really sharp with the ball uh, in terms of throwing it, his decision-making, and would love to see Jake Bobo cross that 100-yard mark for the third time this season and, and really sort of end his uh, UCLA career and his collegiate career the right way. That's really what I'm looking for uh, offensively. Defensively, Will, I was actually really excited about the possibility of going up against Amanikanda. You know, 1,376 yards, 20 touchdowns. And, and truthfully, Will, he was built, you know, sub six feet, close to 200 pounds. He's built like a Bucky Irving. He's built like some of those Oregon running backs that gave UCLA fits earlier in the season. And so I was very excited to see the likes of Muasau and John John Vons and that stout front seven go up against Amanikanda, especially without Slovis and needing to lean on him. Obviously, we don't get that. So I'm really expecting from the defense, the front seven to really bring a lot of pressure on Patty. I believe it's only 12 career passes, Will. You know, he's never had a career start. So getting into that second and long, third and long situation and really bringing the heat with the likes of Latu and the Murphy twins and, and having John John Vons and Carl Jones Jr. fly around and having Muasa really sort of beeline to sort of limit any sort of big plays from happening from the backfield is really what I'm looking for. I really see UCLA being able to score enough here and not really getting stretched too much defensively. It's been a tough year defensively, but I think the fact that Pitt is lacking their key playmakers and the fact that Bill McGovern is back on the sideline and being able to sort of make those in-game adjustments and have the synergy with his unit, I think leads to us to believe that UCLA should be able to win this game pretty emphatically, kind of going away. I see kind of a 41 to 20 type of score in this particular game and the Bruins get to their 10th win. Yeah, no, I completely agree with, you know, all those points you made and just having McGovern back because you look at what the defense was before and after Bill McGovern. It's like the Bible before AD after AD, you know, <laughs> it was 25.9 points per games allowed with McGovern that shot up to about 32 points a game. So there was clearly a difference, you know, the past defense kind of went in the gutter as soon as McGovern kind of went out there. So that's going to be a really key factor to having him back. And I'm going to start and I want you to follow up with me and just some players you're excited to see 
you know, maybe next year is kind of the year for them, you know, to build their, you know, performances. TJ Harden is a guy that we saw in that Cal game really take a step forward. And I really believe he has a chance to be the next great running back in this lineage of UCLA tailbacks that we've seen Deshaun Foster really create and mold this running back room, whether it goes back to Demetric Felton, Joshua Kelly, Charbonnet, you know, uh, Britton Brown. I think Harden has those intangibles where if he does all the little things and he continues to progress, it's an NFL back. And that's what Foster can offer to these running back rooms. So he's one guy I'm really excited to see in the bowl game. Another guy, uh, twins, I will say, is a, the other two guys that I'm really pumped about. They're from Texas originally. This means more to them coming back to a Sun Bowl environment. The Murphy twins, I think they're going to come back now. I think you do as well. They had flashes this year that show me they can be NFL talent. This is where the NFL evaluation starts for them. If you have a great bowl game and you can put that on tape where these NFL scouts are sitting either in their living room with their families watching the game or they're in attendance, you know, watching and scouting you as a whole, you get the Murphy twins off, you know, the edge and maybe they get a sack, maybe they get some pressures. That's going to translate into your NFL stock moving forward. So, Play a big bowl game here, and I think, you know, you could be moving in the right direction. And I'll put it up. There's three guys that were mentioned in the Ben Bolch article that are freshmen that are going to make some sort of appearance in this game. Highly talented safety, Kamari Ramsey. He was the highest recruit in the class last year. Braden Pagan, uh, you know, a freshman receiver coming in. He's, you know, torn it up on the practice field. I think he's going to initially get his spot. And the guy that I'm most excited for, Madman, we are finally going to see Jaden Marshall in some capacity, who I tabbed as the next Kaz Allen, more of that DeAnthony Thomas role. So those are the guys that I'm really thrilled to kind of see and see how they evaluate. Who did I leave out in terms of who you're pumped about come the bowl game? Because I know we talked about DTR and Bobo. Who are the guys that you're thinking, man? No, Will, I, I love that you mentioned in particular Kamari Ramsey and Jaden Marshall because – Kamari Ramsey was arguably the most decorated recruit, the most decorated get that UCLA had last year. Remember, they flipped him from Stanford and really with very high visions of being able to anchor this secondary. And when you look at the fact that Blaylock and Osling III are going to be leaving, they've termed out, you need those reinforcements in that secondary and then again, Jaden Marshall, I love, and obviously we've, we've said it as the next Kaz Allen built that way. He's twitchy, he's fast, he's very versatile. And I'm excited to see what it looks like on the field with him and just how comfortable he is in a college football environment. And I think I'm more excited again about those leaders that are going to be in 2023, Will, moving forward. Because if we zoom out and we look at who's potentially leaving this roster, You're looking at the leading passer, the two leading rushers, the three leading receivers, the three leading tacklers, and the leading sack man. That's all potentially who's going out the door for UCLA going into 2023. So who's now going to anchor that secondary? Who is going to replenish that receiving room now that Bobo and Kaz are gone? Who's going to take the mantle from Charbonnet? Who's going to potentially be the anchor in the front seven if Latu and Moasel leave for the draft, which we think they probably would and should, given injury history, given production, given relative upside. So we're looking for these next leaders. And I think Harden, Ramsey, Marshall are all in line. And, and in addition to that, Will, I want to see some momentum with the existing receiving room as well. Because receiver is the one area where I'm questioning whether this team is elite going into 2023. How's TMA going to look? How's Logan Lawyer going to look? Are we finally going to get all of Cam Brown for a whole season? So looking at those guys in particular on offense, and then defensively, again, I think the Murphy Twins taking on that mantle from Latu as being the preeminent pass rushers, and John John Vaughn's potentially taking the mantle from Wausau as being really that linchpin in the front seven. So I think you nailed it. I think these are some of the other names that I'm looking for. This is that ultimate bridge game, Will, of being able to cap off the 2022 season with that huge milestone of double-digit wins, but now setting the stage for 23 for Chip to be able to build on moving forward. And this would be a program record 
if tying record, if they can get the win in the Sun Bowl at 10 wins, it would be the sixth Pac-12 team to reach 10 wins. Pac-12 has been outstanding this year. It may even be better next year with DJ Ugalele coming in, Shador uh, Sanders coming in for Deion Sanders. We got quarterbacks galore. You know, Bo Nix coming back, Penix coming back, Caleb Williams, and my personal favorite, the five-star recruit Dante Moore, on paper the starter for UCLA next year. So a lot to look forward to. Just going to go over some bowl game facts for UCLA before we dive in to the transfer market. Uh, this will be the 37th bowl game that UCLA has played. They are 16, 19, and 1 all time. The first bowl game we've played since 2017 when we lost in the Cactus Bowl to Kansas State. And, you know, UCLA was supposed to play in the Holiday Bowl last year, got out. We've mentioned the 3-1 and one record in the Sun Bowl. Let's try to make that 4-1, and one, you know, come, you know, December 31st. A lot of great things to look forward to in this game. A lot of great transfers to look forward to coming in, Madman. And I'm going to start. I just want to get your opinion because we've had four or five transfers come in before we've been able to talk about them. So I want to get kind of your first opinion on some of these guys. And you referenced the receiving room kind of needing to step up. And where I'm looking next year as one of our strengths is the tight end room. I mean, Hudson Habermill, we talked about, it, has the build and the skill set to be that tight end, you know, where – where he can finish his career as in, you know, all Pac-12 level receiver. And we saw it already this year in flashes with a Carson Ryan being a true freshman, making plays, you know, in the early parts of the season. But the guy that we got, the most talented recruit, quote unquote, that we were able to acquire was Maliki Matavo, you know, transferring down from Oregon. This guy was a four-star recruit, uh, you know, going up to Eugene. He scored a touchdown in that Ohio State upset they had last year. This is a big time ball and he is a big dude built very similarly to Habermill, six foot six, 256 pound dude. He's not going to be your Carson Ryan where, you know, Carson Ryan goes out for receiving routes, may not be the blocker. This is a dual wheel tight end where they're blocking and he's going out and receiving. So this is kind of the hybrid of a tight end you want built similarly to Habermill. Give me your initial thoughts on Matavo because seeing that we were able to acquire this guy, a guy I was not expecting and just strengthening our tight end room to arguably the strongest in the Pac-12 next year has got me very excited for UCLA football. Yeah, Will, you said it best. Mike DeVeo, again, a great get at four-star. And again, it comes down to sort of that ilk of what makes Chip Kelly offenses go. We've talked at, at length about the ability to establish that zone read running game. And then really that primary receiver has always been the tight end. And whether we go back to the UCLA history with Asi Asi, Caleb Wilson, your main man, Greg Dulcich, or going back to the chip days with uh, the likes of an Ed Dixon, it's always been the tight end has anchored. And Chip always likes to have a variety of tight ends that can do a multiple of different things, whether it's blocking, whether it's catching difficult balls in short yardage situations or being able to stretch it a little bit more vertically to balance out the field. And I think Maitaveo comes in and I think he complements Carson Ryan very effectively, who's a little bit more skilled with the ball. Habermel is a little bit more powerful with a little bit more explosiveness, but also a great blocker. I think Maitaveo is going to be that guy who's really going to be that inside of eight yard specialist. Because let's recall here, Will, UCLA also loses some athleticism at tight end with Michael Azike. Michael Azike with the, the great game against SC. And where did he really have his damage with SC was really in those red zone situations and then in that kind of play action boot game on that longer touchdown. So Mike Taveo comes in and fills really an essential need. And him, Habermel, Ryan by committee, I think are really going to establish UCLA in that up to eight, eight to 10 yards type of situation with that running game to then be able to set it up for the wide receivers. Huge get. And especially, Will, if you are going to start a true freshman quarterback, which you and I believe will ultimately be the case, true freshman quarterbacks, regardless of how talented they are, speed of the game is a little bit different from high school. You're going to sort of need to settle in that tight end, having that security blanket as that check down, as plays begin to break down, as the pass rush begins to collapse, as maybe option one, option two on the outside are covered is going to be so vital. And I think Chip really sensed that. And it was very interesting to me that they were able to get Maitavea out after Dante Moore 
flipped from Oregon to UCLA, and then an Oregon tight end flips to, to come to UCLA as really sort of a almost a little bit of a package deal for Dante Moore to have a weapon to get going in the 23 season. So this was a huge get and their most talented get of, of 23 outside of, of course, Dante to LA. And we, you know, we've kind of just been picking on Oregon when in terms of getting guys, Chip Kelly, the most successful coach in their, you know, college history coming to UCLA. Jalen Davies was the highest talented recruit we had in the transfer portal last year, who I fully expect to have a huge breakout season next year. Hey, most talented secondary in UCLA history or Chip Kelly history didn't happen this year. You know what you do when you're down? You double down. So next year is the year for me. Thriller, you with the UCLA secondary, you're like a crypto investor. You're like, you know what, man? I put all my money in FTX, and it doesn't matter. I'm going back for some more Bitcoin, and I love that about you, man. I mean, that's absolutely fantastic. You got to double down. You have to. It's a mu- In the words of Seinfeld, it's a must-double-down situation. It's an MDDS. I think Davies and Kirkwood, I'm ready for it. They're, ta- they're too talented to be this yeah, cool, to you know, as a, as a unit. So I am very, very pumped for those guys coming back next year. Going to move it to another transfer. And this one was – so we went over the most talented, the most confusing one, I think, for all of us. Colin Schley, and I, I'm banking my opinion on this matter, is we have not gotten the news yet that Garbers or Martin is transferring out. Because I just don't foresee a way, and I'm not – Doubting Colin Schley, I think he did some really good things at Kent State. I've watched some of the film. We're talking 17 total touchdowns, 2,000-plus yards passing, 492 yards rushing. They had a winning record at Kent State. You know, this is a a, a complete Division I quarterback, not knocking him at all. But I think it was confusing in part because we were expecting Dante Moore. Schley commits in the transfer portal. And we're scrambling for the next 48 hours, kind of going, did we blow our shot at a five-star for, you know, with all due respect, you know, Kent State is a Division I program. For a Kent State quarterback to come to UCLA was a very confusing time. Luckily, Dante Moore was ready for the competition and signs on for UCLA. Schley does some good things, but where do you envision him kind of making his bread and butter at UCLA? Because it's hard for me to envision him getting much time at all after starting at Kent State, I just don't know if I agree with the move for Schley to transfer to Westwood. Will, it's uh, it's an excellent point that you bring up, and you and I were uh, in in the same boat there. That you know what what, what the, the 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 timing was very interesting here. I think this was a product of two things. One was I think benefit for Schley from his perspective. We'll look at, and then benefit for the program in terms of the UCLA football operation, and we'll look at it from that perspective. That weekend that Dante Moore visited UCLA that weekend and the weekend prior, there was a lot of movement in terms of quarterback visits. When you look at DJ Uliungalale, he came and visited UCLA. Schley came and visited UCLA. Essentially all top five quarterbacks in the transfer portal were all visiting different places. And so from the perspective of UCLA, it was obviously Dante Moore is the prize but they were looking at Schley as the insurance policy, the security blanket in the event, because you never know with 18 year old kids, they can tell you all the right things. And at the 11th hour, you show them a new pink uniform and, and, you know, sort of orange shoelaces. And they're like, okay, that's it. We're going to go there now. You know, you never know with 18 year old kids, how they make their decision. So I think for me, Schley was that security blanket from the UCLA side. Now Schley's perspective I think now that he sees Dante Moore here, I think it's one of two options. It's can he potentially beat out Dante Moore for just the one year as as Dante Moore is a true freshman? I don't believe that's going to be the case, but I think he's going to compete and say, well, if I can beat him out and at least have some tape in a power five situation for one year, then I can then subsequently transfer again to another school for my last year of eligibility and really set myself up for success. Or it becomes a situation where Colin Schley is this year's Dylan Gabriel, Will, where, again, Dylan Gabriel, we had him from Central Florida, and then he transferred again. And so there's, I think, a possibility where Schley could transfer again and re-enter the transfer portal here shortly. And I think all of that is going to be dependent upon what Garbers does and what Martin does. 
because I think we, we're we right now one quarterback too many in the room. I think at least one of the guys is going to transfer, if not both of them. And you're going to have a situation where you have Dante Moore as your number one guy, either a Garbers or a Schley or a Martin as your number two, and then Chase Griffin as your number three to sort of round it out. I think th- where what Garbers does, I think, is going to really impact what Schley does and vice versa. I could see Martin stick it out and say, hey, I'm still really young. Let me compete with Dante Moore, see what I need to work on, and then maybe transfer next year. I don't think there's necessarily an urgency for Martin to transfer because he's so young and he doesn't have tape on himself. So I think he stays, but I think Schley and Garbers, one of those two guys is going to be transferring here pretty eminently, and I think we're probably going to get an announcement after the bowl game. I think you're right, and – you know, I love Garbert. It's going to be hard for me to see him go. I thought he was one of the most quality backups. And, you know, I know Oregon State got DJU, but if you put, you know, Chase Garbers on Oregon State this year for a team that was complete on every, you know, aspect of the field except for that quarterback position, they're already in a great bowl game. You know, they, they won the Vegas Bowl. You put Garbers on that team, I think that's at least a win or two more. And I do think they do beat the USC you know, in that game where they lost by on the last second to Jordan Addison play and things of that nature, because Garbers, the guy can spin it. It was not his fault that, you know, a DTR, a guy that talented ahead of him was starting, you know, it was just a different type of thing. And DTR was more kind of, you know, centered to the offense of a Chip Kelly where he's more mobile and he can extend plays and, you know, rush for yards as well. But Garbers is a pro style. There's a lot of universities out there that could want him. And I just want to tip my cap to Garbers. He, did a great job of just kind of holding down the fort as a backup, and he will be missed. So, Colin Schley, we've got the the most talented, the most confusing. And then this, this is the award for the most like a UCLA player, a former UCLA player coming in. And I think you know who I'm talking about. Anthony Adkins comes in, and this is a massive tailback. We're talking about a 250-pound running back that was used mostly like a, you know, a fullback at Army. This guy had a 70-plus yard touchdown run last year, a five-touchdown game for Army, and a guy that was averaging around five yards a carry. Madman, I watched the tape, and you're going to love this because we've referenced him before, and I know he's one of your all-time favorites. This is Skip Hicks 2.0, man. Just give this guy the ball in the red zone, and he is going to get the job done. And I am very, very excited to see what Atkins can do. Sneaky speed, and I think the genius of Chip Kelly – is he saw this guy's tape and they're going, whoa, 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 no disrespect to the Army coaching staff. If we put this guy into more of a running back role, this guy is going to be effective at a level that I don't think the Army coaching staff really, you know, was able to generate, you know, on offense. Adkins, skip picks 2.0. I got to hear what you think about that. Uh, Will, I, I love it from a, from a red zone perspective. Anytime you mention skip picks, in any venue whatsoever, it automatically becomes my favorite next 10 minutes in life. So, uh, you know, kudos to you for doing that. I, I think, Will, you know, when you said most like a UCLA transfer, I think you hit the nail on the head because it comes back to that pedigree that Chip looks for. You know, Chip is looking for guys from Duke, from Vanderbilt, from UPenn, from Harvard, from Army and West Point. These, these top-notch institutions. And I think what Atkins does is the guy who, who, if I were after hearing about Atkins, the guy who needs to kind of ball ball out in this Sun Bowl now, Will, is Yankoff. Because if I'm Yankoff, I'm worried. Because it's Atkins is that guy where he's going to be that hammer now. And now you have potentially three dimensions in the run game where you've got the home run guy in Keegan Jones. You've got the smooth every down back in Harden. And then you've got the guy that's going to pound inside in short yarded situations and red zone situations like Atkins. And I think what Chip can see in Atkins is a raw skill set. You mentioned the 6'1". I believe he's, you know, 245, 250, you know, very thick kid. But when you sort of put him in this condensed triple option environment that Army is running, very hard to sort of reveal all of the skill sets. Now you're going to create more pace, more space in terms of a more traditional zone running attack that Chip Kelly has. And now you've got three running backs that are so complementary of one another in terms of Harden, Jones, and Atkins. And this is why we don't believe 
a, a beat is going to be missed at all in terms of this UCLA running game. They're going to be back at that 225 to 235 yards per game next year because of that dimensionality. So I love this get, and I love this get on a number of areas. It A, it fills a critical need. It's a staple of the Chip Kelly offense. But again, it's a Chip Kelly guy. It's a guy who's coming into graduate school, a guy with academic pedigree, a guy who wants to be here, a leader uh, potentially in the locker room, someone that folks can kind of galvanize around. So home run get here for Chip. And I want to see Yankoff kind of show to the coaching staff that this is going to be really a fight for that short yardage back situation. And I'm really looking for Yankoff to have a big Sun Bowl to create that requisite momentum to really have a battle in the spring in the backfield, Will. I mean, we're set up for just an epic battle in both positions in the backfield. I think who's going to be RB1? We think it's going to be Harden just given the skill sets. But who's RB2 and RB3? I think that battle is going to be fierce in the spring. And then, of course, a quarterback. You know, is, is Dante ready at 18 to just have the keys to the kingdom right away? Or are some of these guys going to battle him out? So I think this game kind of sets up a very compelling spring environment uh, in a very exciting way. Yeah, Adkins very excited about what he could potentially bring to the offense and just a dynamic at 250. And I don't know, you know, I, I used to watch those X-Men movies. I'm not really a Marvel, you know, DC guy. But every time I see him running the ball, it's like I'm the juggernaut bitch from the movie when the guy just runs through the wall. So that is my Anthony Adkins early comparison. We're just going to call that guy the juggernaut every time he touches the ball. Uh, big, big excitement uh, for Anthony Adkins. So we've got the most talented uh, in Matevo. We've got the most surprising Colin Schley. We've got the most like a former Bruin in Adkins. And I want to get to the most important. And it's Spencer Halstead, the transfer guard from Purdue. This is my opinion. I just feel like it's such a position of need, you know, and how the offensive line just moves the offense moving forward, especially with maybe a true freshman quarterback coming in and starting next year with the likes of a Dante Moore. And this is just some of the accolades that Hall Siege was able to put together, you know, at Purdue coming in. This guy was two-time All-Big Ten, 32 games played, 31 starts, three-time academic All-Big Ten. I mean, that is just Chip Kelly through and through books and ball. Zero sacks allowed uh, in the 2022 season, only two sacks allowed in three years. He was the number one pass blocking guard in the Big Ten and number six in the nation by PFF. And on top of that, he was the number two pass blocker in the Big Ten by PFF as a whole. This guy brings a level of importance, especially when you look at the likes of an Antonio Maffi moving to the next level. The interior of the offensive line really dictates the run game. And just adding that type of quality of player to come in, and we saw him – you know, compete his ass off in the Mikey Mack video that he posted about Hall Stege for the LA Football Network. What he's doing against the Michigan defensive line, which is one of the best in the entire country. Hall Stege is a get. And I think because it's the offensive line and, you know, they're the big uglies, we don't talk about them that much. It kind of goes under the radar a little bit more than some of the other positions. But this is as big of a get, in my opinion, as UCLA has had in the transfer portal. Do you agree on that point, Madman? Uh, no question about it, Will. And what I love about this is he didn't give up a sack in all of 2022 in a very top-heavy Big Ten. And let's recall, Purdue played in the Big Ten championship game. And so the, he, he played in very meaningful games in a very difficult environment. And I think what gets a little bit lost here is, A, of course, it's a position of need. You need it for a true freshman quarterback. You need it for the things that you want to do in the running game. You need to be able to replenish some of the losses that you're going to have on the offensive line. We've talked about John Gaines uh, is going to be leaving and, and others. So I love it in that regard, but I also love it, Will. Subtly, it is a recruiting bridge because he's a Big Ten kid and UCLA is now going to be going into the Big Ten in a matter of 18 months. And so now you have this prototypical guard in terms of frame in terms of success and it really creates a domino effect of other players built like him wanting similar things similar playing styles that really want to go to UCLA and build that lineage so I think this has been an under the radar uh, acquisition of course because it is offensive line to your point 
but everything begins and ends with the offensive line for UCLA and a Chip Kelly system. The other guys are nice to talk about. Atkins is going to be phenomenal, but we got two other and three other great running backs. Chile, it's fun to talk about. There are three other quarterbacks in the system. The other guys that we've been talking about, this is a position of need. This is a guy who's going to play right away. I wouldn't be surprised if he was an offensive captain next year right away. And I think he's going to really be a leader of that offensive line. This was the best get that Chip Kelly had, even though there were some more talented guys. I think in terms of value, when we talk about most valuable players, most impactful players, this is the one that stands out for me. Yes. And, you know, we've mentioned Olafetti. He was kind of the runner up to this award, the most important. But we had covered him in Heimlicker before the yeah. Christmas holiday. So our fans that have listened to the show, they know about these guys. Uh, Holstige, that's the guy right there. That is the bread and butter for this offense. And as the great Mark Schlair says, you get paid to play in the NFL for moving a guy from point A to point B. Yep. And Holstige can do that. The offensive line, we've gone into depths on this. It is, for my money, the second or third most important position group uh, behind either the defensive line or the quarterback. So that is the group you want to knock out of the park, and that's what you did by getting a guy like Hall Steege in And there. Will, far and away, the second most important position in a Chip Kelly system and in today's Pac-12, okay? Yeah. Because it's we can talk about generally what's most important in college and in the NFL, but you referred to it earlier on this show. Look who's coming back at quarterback in this conference. 2023 Pac-12 might be the greatest quarterback conference in the history of college football. Ooh. And so when you have these quarterbacks that are so far ahead of these defenses and you are going to potentially start a true freshman quarterback, how do you offset that gap in experience? You offset it through offensive line, through giving him time and through giving him a credible run game. And the way all of that starts with blocking up front. So this is why this is such a critical get when you're talking about literally 75% of the conference is bringing back a guy who they believe can potentially finish all Pac-12 second team. I mean, when was the last time we had that where nine out of the 12 teams believe that, look, our guy – if all things kind of fall right, he's going to finish at least second team, all Pac-12 at his position. So that's why the Halstege acquisition is even more important, not just because of what it means for Chip Kelly, but what it means in the Pac-12 for 2023. And just how Tim Drevno got this unit moving, you know? Yep. I mean, first year on the job, made it such a synchronized unit where success was dictated up front and they dominated most games. I mean, they did not allow a sack to the Oregons, the Utahs, with a guy like DTR, you know, back at quarterback. So a lot of great things going there. Mad Men, it's been a lot of fun covering this before the bowl game. I'm trying to find a place to watch the bowl game. Please, UCLA fan base, send me stuff on Twitter. Where's the party happening? We'd love to be there. I know I definitely will be trying to make the effort to go out and watch the game with some of you UCLA fans, so please let me know. Uh, last thing I'm going to leave you with, Mad Men, and we kind of ducked it a little bit after just talking about the transfer portal. Prediction for the bowl game. What's the final score? Who stands out? Does DTR get the record? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I sort of alluded to it a little bit earlier and sort of tipped my hand, but I think this is going to be a coronation uh, more than a competition for the Sun Bowl on, on Friday morning. I think UCLA is going to win 41 to 20. I think uh, this is going to be a comfortable victory. DTR is going to get the record. He's going to cross 300 yards. And I think we're going to see... Uh, Bobo cross 100 yards receiving, and I think we're going to see some special things out of that Harden Jones Yankoff combination. I think Pitt is going to play well. I think they're going to play well for a quarter, quarter and a half. Narduzzi's teams are so well coached, but at the end of the day, not having the horses that they don't have in this game is just going to be too much to overcome to make this a competitive game in the second half. Bruins get to 10 and three for only the fourth time. In the 21st century, third, three of those four years ended in, in Sun Bowl victories. And, and you alluded to, Will, I think we'll get to four and one in the Sun Bowl, get that bowl victory. Only 34 teams get to call themselves champions every year. UCLA is going to be one of those 34 teams and have the requisite momentum to get into a very, what should be a very exciting, adventurous and compelling 2023 season. 
Wonderful, man. Bruin Bible, we wish you guys a happy new year. We will be following along with the game, so make sure you're looking at us. Make your, sure you're following us on Twitter, LAFB Jams, at Will, LAFB Network. Uh, Bruin Bible, we are officially out. Happy new year, folks, and go Bruin.